something and you're nervous wait for the first mistake and then you got it out of your system and then it just slows so that's lucky well i'm going to start good afternoon good afternoon and welcome to a special time a special place my story of the hendelpin hotel in rehoboth this story is adapted from a written history that i wrote and it's available here in the historical society to the public so that I can cover material on time. I'd like to go through my talk and then have comments and questions at the end. But in the talk, if I say something that's unclear, please tell me so I can explain or make it clear to you. Well, the first thing I wanna explain is that there's a, to be a slide of Sammy Farrell up there. And I was going to explain that I'm not Sammy Farrell. <laughs> I'm not Sammy Farrell. Sammy. Sammy ran the house band at Penlopen for the whole time that the Fabrizios owned the hotel, 19 years. And one of the big reasons for the success of the Henlopen was Sammy's million dollar personality. Uh, I played one of Sammy's favorites, Duke Ellington Satin Da, on Sammy's trombone, which is on display here in the museum. Oh, wow. And I didn't know how it would be playing his instrument, but I lubricated it and got it greased up. It's a fine, it's a fine, lightweight trombone. It really, it, it's, it's, it's fun to play. And so this will be back down in the museum. And um, I need to reboot this. Can I reboot it? Yeah. So it's just going to take a minute. Because the, I left it on too long uh -oh. while we were waiting. Yeah. And so now I need to, I, I apologize that we were practicing earlier and I left the computer on, went to sleep. Now I have to wake it up. And then we'll be really, should be good to go. Well, I will continue. So I'm, my, my next part of the talk is to explain I'm not Sammy Farrell. I already did that. But who was I? Well, I was a houseboy employed by the Hendelfin Hotel in 1961, which is part of what I call the golden age of the, the Hendelfin Hotel. Well, how did I get involved as a houseboy? Well, we hope it was the destination of our family's spring migration every year from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to Rehoboth for the whole summer until Labor Day. On the last day of school, my dad and mom would say, when school's out, you kids get home as quick as you can. We'd run home and jump into the station wagon. My father, my mother, my grandmother, my two sisters, our cocker spaniel, and sometimes a goldfish. And we wouldn't return to Pennsylvania until Labor Day when school began. My father's rule was that at age 16, the children had to find summer jobs. And that's how I became a houseboy at the Henlopen Hotel. Only later did I appreciate how 
special this experience would be. So I, I talked about a special time, a special place. What, what helped make the hope a special place? I think the great physical location, location on the ocean with mature trees going right down to the boardwalk. It wasn't a barrier island. A warm climate moderated by the ocean breezes. In the post-World War II, economic growth and rising prosperity that enabled people to take vacations and the easy access from Washington, D.C., particularly after the Bay Bridge opened in 1952. So why was Hanlopen a special place in Rehoboth, which was special? Complex, but I think that sometimes a special place intersects with people who create memorable times. There have been other special times and special places in America. Let's think back together. The Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s, when African-American culture just flourished. Another one would be South Philadelphia, American Bandstand in the 1960s with Dick Clark, where high school kids could walk over to Channel 6 ABC and be on national television and dance to live performances of the top 10. And finally, Silicon Valley in the 1970s, where you could start a tech company in your garage and maybe sell it for a billion dollars. <laughs> but there's something about all of these special times and special places. They come and they go. They don't stay. Technician. Not yet. Give not it a yet. minute. Not yet. <laughs> Give it a minute. You're doing good. Well, yeah, yeah. You're you're, I think you're, I think you're. They don't need pictures right well, now. No, I think they do. You're creating I think, pictures. I think they do. <laughs> These special times, they come and they go. Well, Michael and Francis Fabrizio were attracted to Republic. That's not me. No, it's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Michael and Francis Fabrizio were attracted from Washington, D.C., who took a chance and purchased the Henlopen Hotel from a Mr. Sidney Banks in 1950. My next line is, look at this rare photo. Well, it's very rare. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rare photo. Look how smartly they're dressed. <laughs> Should we just go keep on going? No, just a minute, because I'm going to have a in just one minute, I promise you. If, if not, I'm gonna, all these people are gonna hang me. <laughs> I'll play my trombone again. <laughs> so, yes, you, sir. Do you know how much they paid for it in 1950? There's a lot we don't know. And okay. one of the things we don't, we know about the older hotels, what they paid, we do not know. And there's oral histories with Francis Trebizo, but nobody asked the question. No, but, and we don't know where the wealth came from. They were obviously well to do, but we don't know how they got the assets to buy it. And we don't know the price. Hey. Hey. Right here on the front row. Trombone. And this is the houseboy from 1990. Oh. Handsome, right? yes. Yes. Now, we're, now we're back in sync. Look at this rare photo. How <laughs> smartly they dress. They look like they're ready to have fun. I bet they were fun. Oh, I turned it too soon. Yeah. The Fabrizios had had visited Rehoboth. Well, that's the Free Breezios on the right side there. That's, uh, let me show you uh, Blue and Rollins and the Breezio. They visited Rehoboth several times in the past during Michael and Peggy Fabrizio's honeymoon. But when the brothers bought the hotel, they had no hotel management experience. 
and the hotel needed a lot of work. Francis Fabrizio was a dentist who practiced in Washington. He came most weekends. Michael was here working full time. And they had a vision of what they wanted Hen Lopen to be. And so it became the epicenter of an evening of social ritual with cocktails, dining, and dancing to the music of Sammy Farrell's band. The Hen Lopen operated under the American plan, which means that the hotel rates included meals for the guests. This resulted in the guests hanging around the hotel, spending a lot of time there, mainly with other guests, becoming friendly. The Hen Lopen felt like they were at home. Next door to the hotel was the Stuart Kingston Gallery, Maurice and Jay Stein Gallery, showing Oriental rugs, collectibles, porcelains, Chinese porcelain jewelry. The hotel guests roamed freely back and forth between the lively banter of the auctioneers and the dancing in the club with Sammy Farrow's band. Now, Sammy didn't have a formal music education beyond high school band. But it was his personality, it was his million dollar personality that really drove the success of the band in the hotel. <laughs> Sadly, I never heard Sammy play. Mm -hmm. I was only 16, I couldn't go into the party, I couldn't go into the lounge. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael and Francis Fabrizio quickly realized that the Hand Open needed a new management team. I wish we had more photos of the hotel team but people didn't carry cameras around with them like they do today in their phones where everything that happens is recorded somewhere. Well, there are some key members of the team that I really need to introduce you to. First is Ashley Jenkins. Actually, was N. Ashley Jenkins, general manager. He was a classy guy from the Marion Cricket Club on Philadelphia's main line. From his corner office, I remember in his corner office, directly facing the lobby, with his open door, he could see who was coming and who was going. He would work the crowd, making sure everyone was given the attention that they expected. The formal dining room was known as the Persian room, and it required coats and ties for the gentleman. If the gentleman didn't have a coat and tie, Mr. Jenkins would discreetly lend them to you. And there were the regulars, people who came every season and stayed for most of the summer. Here are two of them that we have records of, but one of them I remember. A Mrs. Schmidt, who, I didn't get there yet. <laughs> okay, well just, okay. A Mrs. Schmidt of the Schmidt Banking Company of Baltimore, we rent two rooms for the season. She stayed in one room, and the other room was for her clothes. <laughs> also, for friends that she would invite to stay weekends. There is also a Mrs. Monger, whom I remember. Mrs. Monger seemed content to sit alone dressed in black and just watch the goings on. She reminds me now of the image of Queen Victoria leaving over the death of Prince Albert. But of course, when I was 16, I never even heard of Queen Victoria. <laughs> Another key manager, though not as visible to the public as Mr. Jenkins, but just as important, was Mrs. Skaggs, my boss. She was brought in to upgrade the housekeeping, like the saying, a new room sweeps clean. She managed a team of maids and three houseboys. The maids worked very hard. The front of house may have appeared genteel, but the back of house consisted of long, hard work, mostly without air conditioning. One of the maids in particular appeared very elderly. The two houseboys besides me were brothers a little older than me, whose father was attached to the Dutch embassy in Washington. They were interesting fellows. The houseboys' job were to wash windows, and I learned you can wash windows using newspaper. You don't have to have paper towels and things. Clean the public spaces and lavatories, miscellaneous other <coughs> duties. One Sunday night, when the dance floor lounge was closed, Mrs. Skaggs instructed me to scrub the parquet dance floor on my hands and knees with a bucket of water and Brillo pads. I really worked. So the next day, it would be Monday, 
I asked Mrs. Skaggs how the dance floor looked. And all she said was, it could have been better. <laughs> the other thing I remember is how the hotel's very big supply of personalized coat hangers ran out long before the summer ended. <laughs> so if you ever took a hanger from a hotel, you're not alone. <laughs> and I even developed a shortcut in sweeping the second floor lounge in the lobby. In cahoots with the hotel elevator operator. Remember, anybody remember hotel elevator operators? He was around my age. And I would have the elevator stop about a foot above the floor level. And then I would simply sweep the dirt and dust down into the <laughs> But I never did that when Mrs. Skaggs was around. <laughs> there will be more slides, I promise. And the hotel had a team of bellhops, sharp-looking college-aged men in uniforms who worked for tips. Sammy Farrell's oral history that we have from 81 relates how the Hamilton management team would follow the careers of the Bell team after they left the Hamilton, following their educational and professional progress. There was a feeling of family at the Hamilton. I imagine it's like there is today at Funland with the False Knot family. When the Bellmen were busy, the house boys were occasionally called in to fill in. I can remember one call for more towels. So I arrived at the room, knocked on the door. I found an attractive woman wearing a nightie <laughs> sitting on her bed. And as soon as she saw me, an instant look of disappointment. <laughs> I was a 16-year-old houseboy instead of a sharp-looking college-age bellman who she was expecting. <laughs> so I gave her the towels and left. No tip. <laughs> Another lady called to complain too many flies in her room. This wasn't unusual since many of the rooms were not air-conditioned, so people would open their windows. So, when to her room armed with one of those old-fashioned pump spray aerosols. Oh my gosh. I think the spray was called Flit. Yeah. Remember Flit? Remember the ad, Quick Henry the Flit? Why well, is Quick John the houseboy the Flit? <laughs> so I will turn the page. I sprayed her room with DDT and left. <laughs> and the pool attendant was another member of the team. He was a teenage son of either Michael or Francis Fabrizio. I, I, I can't remember which, but probably Francis. He, you know, his family owned the hotel and he got along just fine with us. He was a good guy. One day I came to work and I saw a small gathering around the pool in the morning. There was a snapping turtle swimming around in the pool. <laughs> so we couldn't decide whether the turtle walked up from Lake Girard on its own or whether it was part of a prank. I vote for a prank. But I don't remember seeing snapper soup on the dinner menu. So we're hoping that Mr. Turtle got back into Lake Girard. Here's my chance to do, use the clicker. Here we go. The next member of the team is Adolf Fisher, executive chef. Here he is in the dining room with the wait staff. And Michael and Francis Fabrizio. And it really is rare to have a picture of them in the hotel. So there's the way staff, and the far left is um, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Re Mr. Fisher was recruited from the Washington, D.C. area to strengthen the food service. Off season, he worked for the Jesuit community in Washington. He was on duty six or seven days a week for the summer season. And Mr. Fisher always made sure there were pots of leftover food available <coughs> free for employees to eat in the kitchen. I really remember seeing Mr. Fisher plotting up the hotel's rear wooden steps to his sleeping room around 9 p.m., dripping of personality. No, dripping of perspiration. That was Sammy Farrell with personality. <laughs> <laughs> so dripping with perspiration to get ready for the morning's breakfast service. As I say, Mr. Fisher was, was highly respected. 
Here's the attractive second floor solarium where guests could mingle and chat with each other. It was a very, very pleasant place. And on rainy days, the hotel would show 16 millimeter movies to the guests. Now they weren't Hollywood blockbusters. These were short documentaries that Francis Fabrizio checked out from the Washington Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> and he included many exciting titles. And I actually remember the movies, having seen them many times. <laughs> One of my favorites, Mosquito Control. <laughs> low, low flying airplanes spraying DTT, DDT over mosquito infested fields. Does anybody remember when biplanes did that? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. 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 Well, they would. Really? Yeah. That's, that's good to know. Another film that they showed demonstrated various cheeses found in today's modern 1960s supermarkets, raw <laughs> cheese. Another one was Louisiana pierrot makers. And if anybody wonders what a pierrot is, it is a canoe-like boat carved out of the trunk of a cypress tree by hand. And it was done by the uh, Creoles of French descent in Louisiana Bayou. And the last movie I can remember it was an Indian Hindu wedding procession with a cooperative decorated, decorated elephant. <laughs> now, sometimes I get kind of boring doing it over and over and over. Occasionally, I would run the projector backwards <laughs> to the delight of the children present. And I would show airplanes flying backwards over the mosquito fields, sucking up the DDT. <laughs> they love that. If you're curious, DDT was pretty much ended in 1972 for most agricultural purposes. And one of the people who gets credit for that is Rachel Carson and her book, uh, Silent Spring. Thank you. Then there's another challenge of showing these movies. Once in a while, the projector screen would fly off, the, the projector spring would fly off the sprocket. So the movie would stop. I would turn on the lights and crawl around the floor under the chairs <laughs> and try to find the spring. So I could hook it back up and start the movie. And my motto is that's show business. Yeah. Here is a photo of the Persian room. I'm interested, this is kind of like an example of Orientalism. <laughs> Oriental, and Orientalism is a fascination with <clears throat> and patron. Nizing Western attitude toward Middle Eastern, Asian, and North African culture. <coughs> Orientalism styles are used frequently in many art forms, art, music, and buildings such as the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. And it was really a, a, big, a big trend back in the earlier days. Here are guests. I didn't remember this myself. But here are guests dining al fresco on the veranda. <laughs> the north end of the boardwalk was the place to see and be seen. It was, as they said, the nation's summer capital. And the Henlopen included these guests over the years. Senators Estes Kiefhofer, John Williams, Wilbur Mills, Watergate Judge John Sirica, and Lucy Johnson, President Johnson's daughter. And Lucy Johnson was known for hanging out at Whiskey Beach. In <laughs> Beach. And eventually, according to uh, according to uh, Sammy Farrell, she married her bodyguard. Did she? Yeah, I guess it's a true fact. So we've seen parts of the interior of the hotel. Here's an aerial overview. You can see the motel in the back there. Yeah. So here is the motel. I'm going to use my little pointer here. Had 28 rooms, plus cabanas, had the swimming pool, was air conditioned. Not all rooms in the hotel were air conditioned. And it was open in the winter, which was new for the hand open. Then you see a 1960 white Cadillac. Oh. <laughs> Here's 
I'm 90% sure that this was Michael Fabrizio's car. I noticed, of course, his car. It was my father owned the same identical Cadillac, the same year, the same color, and the same model. One day, I drove my father's Cadillac to work, and I parked it immediately behind Mr. Fabrizio's car, almost bumper to bumper. So if you looked out of the hotel, you have like double vision. <laughs> So a little bit later, I moved it, and I learned what Mr. Fabrizio thought of that. He was merely amused. I just thought it confirmed that he was a nice, a nice man. Amused that his house boy had the same car that he had. <laughs> we talked about Sammy Farrell. Here's Sammy in his later years. His six-day schedule included playing for dining six to eight, and then 9.30 for dancing in the Pines Lounge. And after arriving back in his room, after playing all day, then he would get his trombone out and play taps out from the balcony. And I was talking to a woman just the other day who said that this was coordinated with the Pennsylvania Railroad retirement house next door when they would lower the flag. And so they would coordinate playing taps from Sammy from the balcony with lowering the flag, which you can see right from, from the hotel. I also heard that he would end his shows oftentimes with playing Goodnight Irene. That was the old Weaver's hit, classic hit. He, was, he just lived music. Another one of Sammy's summer rituals was piping out. This consisted of Sammy strutting down the boardwalk with his trombone and an assortment of musical followers. The destination was Rehoboth Avenue, and then onto the Pink Pony, a cocktail lounge. <laughs> Who remembers the Pink Pony? Yes. He would play such favorites as When the Saints Go Marching In and Sweet Georgia Brown, were followed by miscellaneous fans armed with kazoos and other assorted instruments. This is how Semi would celebrate the end of the season. At the end of the year, he would celebrate with his fans. The Fabrizios even contemplated transferring a share of their hotel ownership to Sammy to reflect their appreciation for his role in their success. In later years, Sammy could no longer play his trombone because of dental problems. This is ironic since Sammy's wife, Dr. Mary Lisi, was a dentist. <laughs> Sammy died at age 87 in the year 2001. The piping out tradition has been reinstated by the Rehoboth Beach Historical Society in 19, 2019. Nancy, is it scheduled for Labor Day, September 5 this year? Yes, it is. Will there be kazoos? I have 250 kazoos. I hope you have enough. <laughs> I hope you have enough. These vignettes capture the feel and flavor of the Henlopen Hotel during what I call the Henlopen's Golden Age. But let's answer the original question, what made the Henlopen a special place in Rehoboth? To me, it was Michael and Francis Fabrizio and the management team that they hired and retained during the entire 19 years they owned the hotel. That is extraordinary. But so much happened before then. So let's go back to the beginning. Oh, wow. You probably know that Rehoboth was founded in 1873 as a Christian camp. Well, there's a lot written about that and it's beyond the scope of the talk today. <clears throat> but the town was thriving. It even had train service in early years. This growth caused a need for more and better hotel accommodations. There were some other hotels and two of them burned down. So in 1883, 10 years later, a company was formed for the construction of the Hotel Henlopen, late Victorian style, $20,000. So yes, we know the earlier period and the prices, but, but recently we just don't know. The proprietor was a Mr. L. W. C. Laughlin. Rooms were let for $10 per week. The J.B. Ritchie Orchestra played nightly for dinner and dancing for several years. From newspaper accounts, it was lively. The Professor Boulay was said to give 
cornet solos from the hotel balconies. At one time, three state governors had stated and held open simultaneously, Delaware, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. But here's an announcement card from 1883. That's the opening of the hotel. We don't have to read all that, but it's located within 100 yards of the breakers that accommodated 200 people. Now you'll see, you might see where it says no bar. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can't. Is that an advertisement or a an apology? <laughs> Good morning. Apology. Yeah. Well, it was a Christian Bible camp, I guess. So, so the hotel room rate in 1883 was two fifty to three dollars per day. But you know, when I see old photos from this era, the people seem to be dressed so formally in coats, ties, suits, and hats, I wonder if people would then mingle and have as much fun as people today when they're so much more casual. Well, according to the Delaware Ledger, Ledger the guests certainly did, did enjoy themselves. Here's a quote from August 4, 1883. I have to read it. Quite a number of our pretty girls got real mad at a certain well-known gentleman from Wilmington because he would persist in playing on the piano at Hotel Henlopen when they so much wanted the lovely Polonaise played. They had their revenge for it. A bevy of these same offended creatures caught this certain young gentleman on the sands after he had left the hotel where they succeeded in putting him down. And the way they covered that poor fellow with sand, even to making a funnel out of the back of his collar, was downright fun to the girls, to the fellow, slightly otherwise. Now, to me, this evokes an episode from the mood in the Seaside Hotel, the TV series showing on Maryland Public Television about a holiday hotel located in Denmark in the 1920s. So yes, they did have fun back in those days. New, alter, new owner of the Hotel Walter Burton's description of him open is a little bit later, 1917. Now, the season begins on June 19th. The hotel boasts a, as you can see, a 35 by 90 foot dancing, dancing pavilion. The new 3,000 foot boardwalk, which obviously is shorter than the boardwalk today. And this is important. We hope it features the finest fishing grounds on the Atlantic coast, period. That's quite a claim. In 1926, William Coyne purchased the hotel and rebuilt it into what I call the Spanish head open. This is Orientalism's Henlopen debut. The hotel featured 180 rooms built of concrete blocks, if you can imagine. Electric lights and telephones. It boasted a much larger dining room with a dance floor and the stage. There was a summer theater starting in 1941. I wonder how long that continued. A single room with running water but no bath cost $27 per week. Let's look at the rate sheet for 1937. And this includes meals, it's hard to see. But the point is, single rooms with running water only were 450 per night, 550 with toilet and lavatory added, and six dollars with bath or shower added. First meal. Here's the courtyard of the of the old Henlopen, which was carried over in the one that the Fabrizios ran in the, in the uh, 1950s and 60s. This was a great place for mingling, parties, weddings, and receptions. I remember seeing the Fabrizio daughter's wedding reception. It really added glamour to the hotel. The bride was stunning in her white gown, beautiful gown. And the groom looked like a romantic lead from Hollywood. It, it really added glamour. It's just being there. I didn't go to the wedding. I wasn't invited. <laughs> and we must, and we have to cover the great storm 
and then he's gone in 1962. The nor'easter was worse than a hurricane. Look at the damage to the hotel. Should we move the boardwalk back half a block? The city pondered. Well, they didn't. I bet the Ocean City merchants had something to do with it. Ocean Block merchants had something to do with that. Part of the boardwalk at Rehoboth Avenue was remade of, was remade of concrete and we used for popular record dances on Wednesday nights. Anybody remember that? Record, yeah, that was, they were fun. The Fabrizios hustled and rebuilt the damaged hotel just in time for the Memorial Day opening the following year. In 1970, after 19 years, Francis and Michael Fabrizio sold the Henlopen Hotel to Donald Miller. Miller and a new partner demolished the hotel and built a new hotel and condominium complex in 1972. The management team, Ashley Jenkins, general manager, Adolf Fisher, executive chef, oh. Sammy Farrell, fan leader, all worked at the hotel for the entire 19 years that the Fabrizios owned the hotel. The hotel is presently owned by Capano Management, a development company headquartered in Wilmington. The hotel and the condominium are now separate legal entities. The new hotel held a lavish reception, black tie optional, to celebrate the reopening of the all new Hendelman Hotel and its Horizon restaurant located on the top floor. But the era of house bands and buying oriental rugs and porcelains at auction had passed. And the new layout with the elevated entrance to offset future flooding, flooding was not conducive to boardwalk walk-in traffic. Gene, thank you. We're not there yet. Thank you, Gene. <laughs> So the Horizon restaurant was recast as a venue for private parties under lease to an outside company. The hotel's current general manager, Justin Magavero. Is Justin here today? There he is. Say hi, Justin. <laughs> so the focus today is on personal service, not online booking sites used for so many other hotel companies. The hotel provides changing rooms, for guests to change from swimwear into street clothes before entering the hotel. The Henlopen retains a special beachy charm. I call this slide, the Henlopen Hotel wears braces. <laughs> That's what I call this. The Cape Gazette reported in 2021 that a portion of the stucco fascia had fallen off from the building. The city of Rehoboth ordered new support added. But according to Justin, the beams are merely cosmetic and the hotel is safe and sound. Justin, is it safe and sound? It is. We're starting work in uh, about two weeks. Oh, uh, yeah. Justin told me when I interviewed him that they're moving ahead with refreshing the sleeping rooms over the winter. It was a good year last year. This is the Penn Open today from the beach, obviously. I think it is just a stately structure. But I wanna end with a quotation, which is prescient, which means the season of the future. This quotation is on the record jacket that Sammy Farrell recorded for the Henlopen. And he said, the jacket said, memories of the Henlopen past should be treasured. and its passing should not be mourned. The true spirit of Henlopen lies in the memories created, not in the building itself. Thank you everybody for joining me in this memory. Questions and comments and questions. I want to thank David McDonald and Nancy Alexander director of the Republic Media, the 
Donald David is a volunteer and Nancy is director of the museum. Nancy? And thank you to Lawrence who always puts on such wonderful programs here. So you could I also want to recognize our board president, David Mann. Right there, raise your hand, David. Who um, keeps me taking a lot of phenomenal support of me, which means that everything else can be done. Did you want to ask for um, memories? Did you want to open up the discussion? You, you might notice I asked for comment, I asked for questions and comments. So comments means you may maybe there's something that I've missed or I don't know. And I would love to hear your thoughts, memories, and ideas. Anybody have anything you want to share? Oh, yes, sir. Did you used to have a red port and purple and black top three dotty? You had a red you in your red port convertible? What I what I had, we had an orange Jeep. <laughs> I had a fork, I did have a fork convertible. Yeah. 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 Wow. I remember you. <laughs> Part of the police department. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great. That's a great. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I, I'm intrigued about the Fabrizio area era. Um, I, I knew the Fabrizio family in Washington and the Dennis. Yeah. And they had a beautiful home in Spring Valley. Um, I went out with his daughter a few times, perhaps to take her to proms or get a dog. <laughs> and I remember the wife had. Could have um, been the one who got yeah. married. I Do they it. still have a home in the Hilbert? Well, there was an oral history of Francis Rubizio several years ago. He was in his 90s. Then. He was a senior and then a senior. There, there yeah. is still a presence here in the Hilbert. Yes. Well, if it was a junior, he's probably the one who was working at the pool with the pool boy there. That was most likely, but we have spoken with him and we're hoping to do another oral history with him as well. Would it be great? Dr. Fabrizio? This, no. this the son. son. The son. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. But we don't know what kind of business Michael was in before he. Invested in, in the hotel. I just very curious what he what he did previously. We don't know. I don't know. That the one with the he had a very heavy mustache. I remember that. I thought he was a dentist. That, that's Francis. Yeah, yeah. I understand he was also a professor. One of the investors, right? The two of them, the two the two yeah. brothers. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Question. Yes. Status of the restaurant on the top floor in today's world. Uh, I think we have the manager here. <laughs> Hi, manager. Hello. Uh, it's a banquet facility. So it's been a banquet facility for about 19 years now. It's subletted out to a uh, separate company called Solero. So a husband and wife run that operation. Uh, separate yeah. hotel. But still open in the hotel. Wedding receptions, uh, showers, birthday parties, you name it. Anyone else? They don't need to use it. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious, do you by any chance know if Sandy Farrow lived in the hotel during the summer? I heard conflicted yes. reports about that. Uh, I heard reports just yesterday. Yes, he lived in the hotel so he could see the flag. Mm -hmm. and then my sister, one summer, was living in a motel, I guess, one Virginia, because her husband was working for the summer as an auctioneer at Stuart Kingston, and she would hear Sammy playing from the motel. Oh. But then you read Sammy's oral history. He talks really on about having a, a, a like a place. So I don't think he stayed the same place for 19 years, but we I don't know where he was, you know, throughout that period. But towards his later life, he did have an apartment in the Hinopen Hotel. Yeah. And I think it was on the fifth floor. And John, we were the ones that spoke, and I told you. Oh, you're Louise. He would, yes, you're Louise. He, Hello, Louise. <laughs> when he would play taps and uh he would go when at the railway, is it a railway colony of Pennsylvania? The Pennsylvania but, Railroad was a company and that was for their retirees to go on holiday. Exactly. So and there was a flagpole, you probably have seen it outside. And Sammy would receive a phone call before the gentleman who was going to lower the flag <laughs> at, desk, at dusk. And Sammy would go out into his balcony at the Henlopen Hotel and play taps, trumpet, just as you hear it with the military. And all of the folks at Virginia Avenue on the north side would come to their balconies 
And after he had finished taps, there would be polite applause. It would be nice. very moving. And um, may I just add one other you thing? You My mother's second husband, she was what the Victorians would refer to as a well-married woman. She married three <laughs> times and outlived all her husbands. But her second husband was Donald Hudson Dreyer, who designed the motor, the Henlopen Motor Lodge. And he, that uh, is on file, his architectural design and drawings are at the Library of Congress now. And it was the following year that it opened. And my younger brother remembers holding the tape for our stepfather, you know, outside in the sands. And they were very, my, my stepfather and mother were very close to the Fabrizios, that's the Francis, uh, Francis Fabrizio. And Louise? I think my last memory, yes, I'm sorry. I read, I reread Francis Fabrizio's oral history, and he does mention your brother. Does in the arch, the arch, he does mention him in there. My stepfather. Your stepfather. Oh, yes. yes. Yes, he does. What we're uncertain about is after the 62 storm, I believe it was my stepfather who designed the front that had been, you know, it had been damaged, but that we have not verified. Um, the last memory that I will tell you, my mother, uh, Portuguese, four feet 11 and three quarters. <laughs> and she loved Sammy Carroll and Sammy Carroll loved her. Not as much as his wives, but he loved her. <laughs> and they were great, you know, they loved to dance together. And so as a little girl, I remember my mother dressing for the evening dances and she was very excited to be Sammy Carroll's partner. Briefly, you know, he, he had a way of making every woman that he danced with <laughs> most special. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Yeah, that's great. Yes, ma'am. My parents also were very close friends with Sandy and Oh, yes. And they would often, my brother and I, when we were younger, they would come and, you know, they'd pick a car, Mary and Sandy, to our house on Newcastle Street, pick us up and take us for ice cream. Really? <laughs> 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 but the thing I remember the most was so magical. In my mind, in that era, not only the Henlopen Hotel, but the country club was in town. Yes. And yeah. the country club had dancing also. But I would see my parents go out to either the Henlopen or to the country club for different dancing. My dad would be in a white dinner jacket, and my mother would be in a cocktail dress with my kids. And to watch them dance. I mean, people dance. Yes. 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 And then he played for our wedding reception in Washington. That's that's great to know. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. I too worked at the Hen Oh. And 61, 62 behind the front desk for the switchboard. Did I say anything that was wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but back then, uh, because I was a female, I could only work the switchboard. I was not allowed to wait on guests. But however, the desk clerk had to go to dinner. Yeah. So I got to, to man the front desk, and also I got a free dinner every night. And <laughs> I loved lobster, so every night I got oh, lobster. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and my Parents went to a dance at the older Pen Logan Hotel and they, they were out on the balcony dancing and the balcony gave way. Oh, Everybody yes. on the balcony <laughs> went down. It was quite a thing. Do you know what round that what year that was? Well, it was before I was born, but um I don't know. It wasn't this it wasn't no. this, when this hotel it was. 
That's interesting. Interesting. Somebody else hadn't spoken yet. Yes, sir. Um, I'm sure um, some of the uh, people that are here can help me. But um, if you come down Lake Charles and come up uh, Lake up to um, Bayard Avenue, there's what we call the Palm Beach Hall. And uh, I, I'm thinking that I see uh, that the Fabrizio family uh, has, has always been in, I think. Uh, that the Fabrizio was, was an admiral, if I'm correct. There, I think that was Francis. That the daughter, that the daughter uh, and her husband now own that. Am I correct? Yeah. Are you talking about the house that has the um, French doors that look out onto Silver Lake? Yes. That was the Fabrizio's home. I think it was Francis. Um, they, their daughter was the same age as me, Carolyn Lancia, is what we call her. And the she last, and her husband uh, own the house now. I don't know that, but I know they live back on, um, I think it's the corner of Oak. Yes, and I don't know if they Sir, did you have another question? Oh, oh, um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the auction house that I remember as a kid? Well, Stuart yeah. Kingston Gallery King was on the boardwalk, right. and the Stein family owned it, and it was open for the summertime, and they would have auctioneers. And they would tell jokes, and people would sit there and kind of kind of dressed up to go in there. And by some strange coincidence, my my brother-in-law, who my sister married, obviously, was one of the auctioneers. And he had this joke. They would pass out pens every night with the Stuart Kingston name on it. And he said, This pen is guaranteed to write in every language. <laughs> <laughs> that was his joke. And so it would lighten up the crowd, but what they really would do is push. No, they would show oriental rugs. Right. Mm -hmm. And they would talk about the rugs and, and they would have young men, strong men, bring them out, open them up, and then they would explain how these were made by children mm -hmm. because their hands were small, they could tie smaller knots. Mm -hmm. Now that wouldn't fly today. Maybe that's why we don't do it anymore. But it was a, it was a great thing, but you could come and you could go. And, it was, and, the, and the auctioneers were very glib and it was amusing. And so it just added a classy feel. You go to dinner, you come out and get some rugs or buy, buy some diamonds and so on. That's, that's not all I know about. It, it was fun because it was sort of a, another way. It wasn't of high pressure. No, it, no it, was, it was. It was another joke that I think it was the other uh, was mentioned about uh, was, was that it'd be in July and the sale wasn't going real fast, wasn't what things weren't moving. That's okay. Wait till August. Your your bosses will be down here. But that's usually like when the executives would go away and you kind of make, make a little bit of a cut that you guys were <laughs> fine enough. That's all. That's about all I know about the uh, Stuart Kingston. Thank you. That could be another story. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? You, you mentioned that there was the Spanish version of the hotel that replaced the Victorian one. Yes. Did the Victorian one go in a storm? Did it burn? Whatever. I think from my records, from my memory and my records, it, it was just a new old owner came in and rebuilt it. You just tore the other one down? I believe so. It was maybe some parts were remained, but basically it was a rebuilding. It didn't burn down or anything like that. <coughs> it wasn't a catastrophe. It was just a difference. It was updated with electricity and telephones and things like that. Thank you. Sure. If you have okay. more comments. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Out of curiosity, yes. where was the pink pony? <laughs> 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 it was on the boardwalk. One of the, one of the last the commercial things. It's where the boardwalk closet is now, the big pink hotel. Yeah. Well, that's a big block. Okay. So, yeah. okay. So okay. Did Sammy Farrow do more than one album there? The no. I think I don't know. I have this album. You have it. And it's signed, yes. Well, I tell you, but I, I, I played it and I listened to it. And they played the music just fine, but it wasn't exciting. 
And, but you didn't have Sammy's million dollar personality with however you work the crowd. It was just, it was just okay. But it certainly wasn't something you go back and listen to over and over. Yeah, I remember when they did that. You know, I don't think that I don't think the jacket is, is dated. I don't know. I, I I'd have to go home and look because I don't think I've gotten rid of it through the years. I bet you didn't, but I don't think there's a date on it. So I'm just curious when when they did. I think it was. Well, it had to have been between seventy nine and eight, seventy eight to eighty, something like that. Sammy Farrell was uh, there. I, I don't know. I mean, that's what I got. I don't think so. Well, I was a playing right now. Here it goes, 73. Yeah. I, well, you see this one in 73. So he must have brought it. But this, that, was after the, that was after the Fabrizios. That this. The Fabrizios weren't there then. No, it was like a farewell. But one thing to keep in mind, we're talking about special times for us, special places, yeah. special times. I am willing to bet you that for the team and for the Brizos, it was a special time for them too, mm -hmm. that they would come back and do it for 19 years. Mm -hmm. It was more than a job. So the, it was always closed in the winter then? Yeah, it still is, except for the motel, which was here. Then. Yes. It really was a special place. Special memories to kids. My father died when I was in third grade. In fifth and sixth grade, my uncle would come from Ohio and take my cousin and I to hear the orchestra. We got all dressed up. He buy Shirley Temple's, and and he did a take on. He played have to play Sweet Lorraine. Her name was Lorraine. Oh, Sweet Lorraine. But that was one of my strongest memories of childhood. Okay. I just want to get a round of applause for John. Could you mention, forgive me, this is Simi Thoreau's combo. Yes. Yeah. And there is only one person I trust with it, and it's John. Right That's going back, right back, 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 back in the case tonight. Right back in the hotel. But very special memories. We're so glad you could be here. John, it was just fantastic. We've walked down memory lane. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you.